Um, I have already written the, the plan of the lecture, so I will first um, not hurry and try to come back to some, the, some of the elements of lecture zero and one, because I had the rumors that uh, some of the notation were a bit difficult to grasp, so I'm, I, might, I might review and give more examples. And then before starting the subject of the proper subject of the lesson, I will give you just a hint, a little idea of a notion of general connective that helps also to understand the general structure of this syntax. Okay? And once this is done, we will embark on classical logic. So we will uh, uh, essentially get a system for classical logic by removing the restriction on uh, uh, contraction and weakening that is present in linear logic. But then we are faced with the funny classical logic which has two conjunctions and two disjunctions. So um, some people may think that it is too much and we can uh, indeed reason uh, with a subset of rules because after all one conjunction is enough and one disjunction is enough and I will show you how good it is to take all reversible rules and forget about the irreversible ones. I will show you, um, well, I, I will not do anything with the uh, other choice but just mention that Genson uh, in his papers has this choice and uh, finally, keeping both is a good key to uh, having uh, this uh, computational consistency problem solved. So that's where we will stick to such a system that has uh, two conjunctions and two disjunctions. And then we will discuss how to make it a confluent system so that you don't identify too many proofs. And um, this will rely on the notion of focalization that you have uh, seen this morning. And then we will discuss uh, a variation of this system uh, which I will call indirect. So we will see when, it, when we come to it. And once we have this system, I will discuss encoding from and to this system. So first to this system, so the, uh, as I told you, I, I consider this syntax as an intermediate language. So it means that it should be the target of translations from ordinary functional programming. So we should be able to translate call by name and call by value lambda calculi. And uh, I promised to um, explain some links between this syntax and uh, the operational semantics of the lambda calculus expressed in terms of abstract machines. So I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit of that. And finally, I will show how to translate this syntax into intuitionistic logic, which is usually the last step. Well, the, uh, if, 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 if I put together the translation from uh, lambda calculus to system L and then from system L to intuitionistic logic, Together, this forms a translation from logic, classical or not, into intuitionistic logic. And this is uh, what is usually called a continuation passing style translation. And we will uh, see that the last step, this step, is almost um, trivial, almost textual. So in some sense, this language, SystemL, is already a CPS target language. That's, that's, that's more or less the, the idea. Okay, so let's start with the review of lecture one and zero, and uh, sorry, zero and one. And when, is it, when this is done, I will uh, leave space for questions. Okay, before I, uh, I go on. So uh, let me remind you uh, my uh, short introduction to linear logic where I insisted on, uh, I followed the historical, uh, even if the history is short, it's, uh, it was in, born in 86, so it's like uh, 25 years. Uh, the historical uh, line is to divide connectives uh, in multiplicatives, additives, and, 
and exponentials, and I explained the terminology. And I uh, improved the slide by giving you a table because uh, our discussion in this series of lectures is more along the distinction between irreversible and reversible. And I want to show you through this uh, table that this goes completely orthogonally to the distinction between multiplicatives and additives. That means that uh, the two multiplicatives, one of them is reversible, the other is reversible, and the same for additives. Okay? So, again, the distinction that will matter for us is between irreversible and reversible. And we will really exploit it when we come to this line in the, in the, in the lecture, when we discuss focalization. That was the first thing. Then I wanted to give you an illustration of the syntax because I talked about active formulas and some of you were not very clear about what it meant. So let me just, it's not a meaningful proof. I'm just, tr uh, I'm, I'm just thinking of a proof that ends like this. Okay, so it's a proof of uh, the sequence uh, uh, n plus p uh, um, tensor m a par b gamma 1 gamma 2. And suppose that this proof, uh, the last rule used was the tensor rule. So you introduce a tensor last. And then after this, in, in terms of proof search, you decide to decompose the power. Okay. So let's us, let us see how the syntax of system L is going to transcribe this. So in order to account for the first rule, I will suppose that uh, I have a proof of the uh, uh, assumption n plus p a b gamma 1 and this will be a given command c. And now I will introduce, uh, use the rule to introduce the power which is a reversible connective. So uh, remember for reversible connectives I use a binding construct. So then I get this mu y1 y2 dot c which is a term of a par b uh, in the uh, context uh, of the other formulas, n plus p and gamma 1. Okay. And uh, y1 and y2 were the names associated with the uh, high assumptions a and b. So now you see that if I want to progress in my transcription of the proof, I must change the active formula because the formula that is going to be active in the next rule is not a par b but n plus p on the left and on the right is going to be m. So I need to play this little game of deactivating a par b and activating n plus p. So that's why my uh, uh, picture here is uh, much more verbose than the one up there. Instead of having three lines, I have uh, five lines. So let's first do the deactivation. So the trick for deactivation is just to cut this term with a variable. So instead, now, now you can think of this variable as, as a placeholder for the formula A par B. And uh, the result is a command where y is cut against mu y1 y2 dot c and this becomes again a neutral thing where nothing is activated and now I need to activate n plus p so I use the mu which is the activation construct so mu and uh, I, I use mu x because x is the name of n plus p so mu x of all these commands is going to be of type n plus p. And now I can assemble this term with uh, the proof of m gamma 2 that uh, I suppose to have uh, around. So by pairing them, I get a proof of the sequence. So I, I hope that you can uh, better understand how the syntax works through uh, an example like this. Okay, so the second remark I wanted to do 
is that I listed these reduction rules and I only insisted on the pattern matching aspect of the rules, which is, uh, which is an interesting feature. But um, some people asked questions about what is the role of substitution here, and I have uh, prepared a slide to answer this a bit more uh, precisely. Okay. So, I will, what I want to do is to explain you the first two rules. So, let's do it slowly. So, there is a lemma which is not so completely trivial to prove. It's, it's, a, it's, it's not difficult, but uh, you have to do it with care. On, so, exercise. It's on, uh, on induction on the, on, the, on, the, on the proofs. You can show that uh, for any command uh, that has a type uh, x column a gamma, then, then I know that x occurs uniquely in C because the syntax has been designed to be linear. So it's also, a, also an easy exercise to check that uh, an invariant of uh, the uh, typing rules is that uh, in any term C of a given type, if a variable occurs in the context, then it must occur in C, and it must occur exactly once in C. Okay. So now the lemma says that C... The, this occurrence of x in gamma is always of the form x cut with some term t in as a subterm. Okay, so it's, so c is a is a big term that contains a subterm of the form x cut with t, and this x cut with t corresponds exactly to the transcription, the syntactic transcription of the moment where this a was active where this A was actually introduced. Okay, that's the idea. So, now that we have this lemma, we can read... So, uh, th th this computation rule, which says that T1 cuts against uh, mu x dot C, returns C where T1 replaces x. What does this mean, more concretely? Well, if I replace C by... Uh, uh, this uh, context, okay, uh, and if I do the substitution now of T1 plus in this context, uh, the result of this reduction is actually to have a plugged T1 plus exactly in contact with T2 minus. So, you have to think, maybe I should draw a picture, You have to think that, so this was T1 plus, and this was uh, mu x plus dot c, and somewhere in the proof of mu x dot dot c, at a certain moment, there was uh, x T2 minus. So, here's your cut, which you want to eliminate. So, in, in uh, sequent calculus, this is known, this case is known as the non, no, sorry, as the commutative cut rules. So, while while the, the, the third or the fourth rule express what is called logical cut elimination, where you actually see something happening right at the cut, because you have been introducing on both sides <coughs> the formula that you are cutting, so then you can do immediately something, while in the first or second case, we are accounting for the fact that this cut is not quite ready to know what to do. 
because uh, the, uh, the, this formula may have just been introduced right now, we can believe it, but th the presence of this mu x plus says that this was done earlier for, not, not exactly there for the other cut formula. So by substituting, what I actually do is to let this cut go up towards meeting the appropriate moment where the cut formula was introduced. So the cut moves towards uh, the uh, moment where the formula was introduced on the dual side so that some real interaction can occur. So in other words, in these rules, we have con to consider the third and the fourth rule as the real ones that do computation, and the first two as some control rules that uh, achemine, how do you say this in English, to that um, put on the way, that put you on the way to actual interesting cut elimination steps. Okay? And they are called control because control rules, because you see that if you apply the first rule, then you are going to let the cut go up on the right, while if you apply the second rule, you are going to let the cut go up on the left. So you decide on where the control of your cut elimination uh, is, is going with these rules. Okay, so I hope also that this is helpful. And so there is a slogan here, which is that in this syntax, the substitution operation accounts for uh, all the commutative cuts, uh, the, the management of commutative cuts that you find in uh, a sequent calculus books or papers. Okay. So then I must uh, recall you um, that I also tried to discuss the question of confluence. And I showed you, uh, I, I tried to analyze one of the critical pairs that arise in linear logic. And uh, there are actually two other critical pairs, which I didn't highlight but they are on the first line. And you can believe me, they can be treated well. But there's one critical pair, which if it would be there, would really be harmful. So the critical pair that is avoided by linear logic is the critical pair where you have weakenings on two sides, or actually weakening and contraction on we, uh, any, any of weakening and contraction on two sides is bad. So let me just illustrate this and just make sure that uh, everybody sees why linear logic forbids that. So the really bad critical pair, which we don't have in linear logic, but we will, which we will face when we re remove the restriction on uh, on uh, contraction and weakening is this one. So it's a, it's a really stupid kind of cut. So suppose that A has been introduced by weakening on the left and that A has been, uh, A bar, has been introduced by weakening on the right. Well, both on the right, but on the left assumption and the right assumption of the cut rule. Okay. Then, essentially, the only sensible rule for weakening is the one which is written here. The uh, number, the uh, last before uh, one, two, three, four, five, six rule. So it's easy to see that if I just put anything here, <coughs> the best way to eliminate this cut, I don't know exactly how this was built, 
the, 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 the sensible way to eliminate this cut is to say, well, I started from this assumption and also this one. But I have a very simple way to reach the conclusion gamma delta, which is just to apply repeated weakening from gamma. So that's how you eliminate this cut. You essentially forget this proof. Okay? So, but if... Now, remember that control can go on two sides. And here we also have the same problem. Suppose that on both sides, this has been a weakening. Then I could also decide... So, e essentially, what, what, what is written here is that <coughs> the result of eliminating this cut is this proof here, with some weakening. But I could equally well have said that the result, because I could uh, now decide that this is the guy who takes control, and the, this could also reduce, so it reduces on one hand to this one, and it reduces also to the proof uh, So we have two proofs of the same conclusion gamma delta, which are obtained from this unique proof. And you will admit that they are widely different because this was any proof of gamma, this was any proof of delta. So essentially, you end up by identifying any proof with any proof of any formula. So this is really, really extremely bad. So we should do something about this. Why does linear logic do, do something about this? Well, just because weakening is only allowed on a why not formula. And the dual of a why not formula is not a why not formula. It's a bang A bar formula. But you are not allowed to do weakening on a bang A bar formula. So the t this is the this is more precise explanation of the claim I gave yesterday that linear logic solves this problem of confidence through uh, typing, if you want, through, through more information on, 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 on the formula. Okay. And we will solve it in a different way uh, for classical logic. Okay. And uh, since we'll solve it in a different way, I'm not any more concerned even about uh, making these critical pairs converge. Because what we are going to do is to present you a system that has no critical pair. So the, the system will be, the operational semantics will be restricted in the way that there will be no critical pairs. So since my insistence on linearity of the syntax was linked to the fact to solve these critical pairs, because it was important then to use linearity to keep track of, of a kind of a losange of, uh, losange of, of reductions. I am not committed anymore to linear syntax. So what I shall do is, uh, I need to get this out, out now. Uh, no, not yet. Not yet, because I need something else. Okay, so I'll, I'll do this here. I'm going to rewrite the syntax for contraction and weakening and to make it simpler. So remember that I had an explicit syntax for contraction and weakening. So now I will just use, and I uh, do this for classical logic right away, so for uh, the weakening rule, I will just say that if C is a, a command of type gamma, then I can weaken by just writing mu alpha dot C of type A gamma, where alpha is a dummy fresh variable. So that's my first vi violation of the, of the linear syntax. Now I allow variables not to appear. Okay, so it's alpha does not appear in C. 
And for contraction, I'm violating the second uh, dogma of linearity, namely that if I have C of type gamma uh, sorry, x1 of type a1, x2 of type a2 gamma, then, uh, sorry, it's a a, then mu, uh, yes, that's mu x dot c, where x replaces x1, x replaces x2 of type a gamma. So I now uh, use also the mu construct, and I'm violating the fact, the fact that x occurs only once, because now x occurs at least twice. Okay, in, 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 in this term. So, in other words, I can use the kit of the mu construct to deal with uh, weakening and contraction implicitly. So, that's less bureaucracy in the syntax. Okay, so once this is done, I have a last thing to show before removing the screen, because the rest of the lecture I'll try to do it. Uh, on the board, and in the end, I'll need uh, the slides again. Okay, so I, I promise to give a very short view of general connectives. So there is somewhere here where this is just to, to know where it is. Not sure where it is. Maybe it would take less time to just do it on the board. Yeah, I won't find it. Okay, so let's let's remove and do it on the board. So I don't know how to do this. Um, choo -choo -choo -choo. Stop. This red thing. Yes. Okay, so just a rough idea of what a general connective could be. Okay, so, so I can remove this because it's written here. So it's, it's not quite as general as, uh, as it should be, but it's, it's enough to give an idea. So I will define a general connective. Well, I, I will define an arity, a notion of arity, for a general connective. And this is not the last word on it, it's just a first approximation of this idea. But in the time frame that I have, uh, I, I will not uh, uh, develop this uh, further, but there are more indications in, in the set of slides. So an arity for a general connective is a sequence a number is a sequence of numbers. Of course, a finite sequence of numbers. Okay, so we could write it like a family Ni where I belongs to I. And what does this indicate to me? Well, it indicates to me that for each i in i, there will be a constructor. So, for each i in i, there exists a constructor. And this constructor will have arity ni. So, we will we'll take ni arguments of ni arguments. Okay, and whatever big I is, there always there will always be only one destructor. So there exists only there exists exactly one destructor, and this destructor is going to be ready to 
do a case analysis on all the constructors. Okay, so it's, it's just like in an inductive type. So uh, let's rather than and, and I, I can give you so so, so the destructor has uh, this uh, uh, shape. So let's call me this constructor C I. Okay. So the syntax uh, the syntax of uh, positive terms will be because remember I use constructors for irreversible uh, connectives that is the same as positive, okay? So the <coughs> syntax of positive terms is going to be uh, <coughs> enriched with uh, these constructors. So you have a constructor CI that takes a T1 and then TI, TNI. And then, uh, it, so that's one of the additional cases that you have in T plus. And in the negative terms, you will have this unique mu, which um, has this form CI of X1, XNI dot CI, etc. So for each, ah, sorry, it's, uh, it, uh, okay, so sorry, uh, the, the, um, it's not very good to have both C for constructor and C for command. So let me use uh, okay. k ki, chi for these constructors. Okay, so there is this constructor, I will use the letter chi. So, The mu constructor has this form. It's 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 um, it's a list of uh, binding uh, constructs of the form T i of x1 x n i dot c i, and then the computation rule is that if you match the constructor T i of T1 T n against, so these are actually pluses, against uh, this mu, this big mu thing, so what the rule does, it does two things at the price of one. It does record selection, field selection in a record. So it says, oh, we are interested in the I component. This, this could be seen as a record, which has a, uh, at uh, field I has this information. So I'm going to select, because I'm against this uh, I constructor, I'm going to select this part of uh, the term. And second, I'm doing the pattern matching. So then, this result in T1. <sighs> okay. So now, if you remember the computation rules that uh, were given for the tensor and uh, for the plus, you will see that they fall in this general scheme. So let, let me repeat them here. So for the tensor, it was T1, T2, mu X1, X2 dot C reduces to C where T1 replaces X1, T2 replaces X2. Then for the uh, plus, it was in left of T1, mu in left of X dot X1 dot C1 in right of X2 dot C2 reduced to C1 
where T1 replaces X1. And similarly for in right of T2 blah blah, which reduces to C2 where T2 replaces X2. <coughs> it's a very easy exercise to check, well, maybe someone can tell me, what is the arity of uh, uh, the tensor according to this definition? Huh? Singleton, Singleton 2. And what is the arity of uh, the sum? One one. It's a sequence, the sequence of 1-1. One one. Yes. Okay, so it's just to give you a rough flavor. The, the, the real picture, which is uh, actually the one which I like, is where uh, I have more information. Instead of having numbers, I have actually sequence of signs. And these signs are of four kinds. They are, they give me an indication of being left or right in a sequence, and they give me an indication on being positive or negative. So I have four signs. Positive on the left, positive on the right, negative on the left, negative on the right. So instead of having a number ni, which is like just a sequence like this, for each of these dots, so here it would, it would just be the number six, I have actually a sequence of six signs. Okay. And moreover, also I have a sign which tells me in which syntactic category the constructor is going. Okay, but I, I'm, I'm not going to do this in detail. Okay, so now I'm ready to discuss the question of classical logic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. I, I, I also said that you could ask. ask why? Sorry. This is important to have Well, if you want, what we want is to have a system where we don't identify everything. So we, 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 we want to, uh, with the minimum that we want, in, to give a denotation of semantics to any system is, is that, for example, if you have this, not be identified. So you, 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 you have some, uh, some basis for, for working on. Okay, so is there any more questions on, uh, on the basics of the syntax? Okay, yeah? Then uh, normal forms are all uh, uh, provably unequal. <laughs> they, they, they are not provably equal. So, a confluence, what, uh, a simple example, what is the confluence and the space in the state of the So, to get an idea of the time frame. Well, the time frame is written down the system as we had it for linear logic 
except that I have removed the exponentials and uh, that I have uh, now uh, the unlimited weakening and unlimited contraction with, uh, uh, with this non-syntax for them. I mean, I, have, I, I don't have special constructs for them. I use just use a mu. Okay, so let me first discuss what would happen if I decided... So it is, uh, as I said in the first lecture, it is an easy exercise to show that in the presence of these two rules, you can inter-derive uh, uh, this conjunction rule and this conjunction rule. These two are inter-derivable. So you might want to decide to go only for the reversible ones. So let me try, for example, to just take the reversible ones. That's the reversible um, conjunction. That's a reversible disjunction. And I'm going also to, to do something else. I don't take the cut. And I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not taking uh, term decorations here. So ma maybe I should just uh, extract this uh, right here. So I'm just extracting this form of disjunction. And I will call it R, because I just take one. And I'm extracting this form of disjunction. Yeah? Sorry? So which color is uh, possible? The blue doesn't seem to be available. Hmm? Or another red. But this red doesn't work. Yeah, thank you. And let me extract the axiom, but uh, with the weakening. Then, quite interestingly, this system is complete for probability. And the proof is trivial. Or it, it requires a few lemmas, but it's, it's trivial, it's an exercise. So I give you a, hund, a hint for the proof of the exercise. Yeah, I don't even need the contraction, it's, it's going to be admissible for this system. So the reason is the following. You Attempt, so of course it's going to be sound, because all these rules are written to be sound. So now the question is, if, uh, if a sequence is valid, if I know that this sequence is valid, then there is a proof attempt which will uh, succeed. Now what happens here is that because the rules are reversible, you are going to develop your proof attempt in any possible manner, this doesn't matter. They are all to be as good as the others because everything is reversible. And while you develop your proof tree, you keep an invariant. You maintain an invariant, which is that all the leaves of your attempted proof together are valid because they are equivalent to uh, your first sequence, which was valid. So when, because the rules allow you to decompose formulas up to the atoms, you actually end up with sequence that only have, to, so when you fully develop your proof tree, you have sequence that only contain atoms. And then it's a very easy lemma to show that a sequence that contains atoms is valid if and only if it has the form of an axiom. So a sequence that contains only atomic formulas is valid if and only if it contains two atoms, one of the form X and the other of the form X bar. And that's the end of the proof.
So they are good at something. The, 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 the all reversible pro presentation is nice, but doesn't lead to any good computational properties. It's about the completeness of probability, which is a good thing, but doesn't lead to anything. Now, as I told you, uh, I think, because I'm not sure, I'm, I, I never read really the old papers, but I, I'm pretty sure that Genson's presentations were based on uh, having only the rever irreversible presentations of the connectives. And one of the reasons why he wanted to, to do this, oh no, I don't know, I don't know, it's, it's just a like this. Okay, and then I think that we need to keep both. So now we will start to work on focalized classical logic. So what I shall do in the next uh, 10 minutes is to restrict the space of proofs and to restrict the computation rules. I could actually dispense with restricting the space of proofs and just restrict the operation semantics. So the second aspect is more important. But somehow I'm used to do both and it uh, goes well with the spirit of the lecture of this morning as well. Because uh, uh, this morning I probably, uh, even if I was not there, but I have read the no notes of Frank and heard the, his lecture last year, one of the concerns that he has is to uh, let the sequent calculus, the space of sequent calculus proofs match the space of natural deduction proofs. And since there tend to be many more sequent calculus proofs, focalization is a way to trim this to get a kind of one-to-one uh, -one correspondence with the, with the natural deduction proofs. So that's good motivation. And uh, I want to follow this spirit and I want also to trim the, the possible proofs here. So what I'm going to do is to, to be very syntactic because I also don't have too much time. So I will do this very, very syntactically. So instead of having three categories of terms which were C, T plus and T minus, that's what we had before, then we are going actually to do something else. We are going to do C, V plus, T plus, and T minus. Okay? And I will need an auxiliary definition, which is that V is the same as V plus or T minus. Okay, so I will use V to stand either for V plus or T minus. So these will be called the commands. These will be called the positive terms. These will be called the negative terms. And these will be called the values. Okay. So, commands, there is no change. A command is only of this form, t plus, t minus, which I don't mind uh, to write also in the other way around. It's not a problem to write it this way, this way or the other. Okay, so now, the line for T minus is not going to change a lot. So um, I should probably have, uh, well, anyway, I, I write it directly. So the line for T minus is the same as uh, you have seen in the slides. So a T minus is either an X minus or a mu X plus dot C or uh,
Okay, so these, these, these are the terms corresponding to introducing uh, the negative uh, disjunction, uh, the negative uh, conjunction, no, negative disjunction, and here the negative conjunction. And uh, here we make a dramatic change. So a term is either to going to be a mu or a value. So a value is a non-mu term. And now a value is going to be defined by some hereditary way. So you probably have got from the lecture of this morning the idea that in a focalized proof, when you are decomposing a positive formula, you are committed to do this in a consecutive way until you uh, reach a negative subformula. So you have this notion of focus where you cannot change your mind and try to decompose another formula while you are decomposing a positive formula. So I'm going to give an exact syntactic account of this. So a uh, value is either a variable and so previously previously I just had the pairing of two terms t1 t2 that was uh, a, a term of type tensor so this is not possible anymore now it's going to be a v1 v2 where v1 and v2 are in this category so that means that if V1 is a negative term, it's okay. But if V2, well, but if V1 is a positive term, then it's a real constraint. If V1 is a negative term, then, well, it's just as in the previous syntax. But if V1 is a positive term, then it must be a V plus, which means that it should continue to be of this form. So that's exactly what the notion of value should be. What is a value of type A times B? It's a pair of two values, one of type A1 and the other of type A2. But if A1 is itself a product, then this value must be a pair of values, etc. So this is the reason why we call them values. And the same for in left of V1. So typically, let me tell you what I forbid. I forbid to form the term in left of mu x minus dot c. This is illegal in this syntax. So I'm restricting the syntax. And I think it's all. That's the syntax. So this is restricted syntax for focalized proofs. So that's the syntax. Now I will design the proof rules according to So there will be a fourth judgment so, so far we have seen, we had three categories and three judgments. Now we have four judgments. So maybe I should have, <coughs> sorry, written them here. So corresponding to these uh, four categories, here we will have uh, the judgment that C is a command of type gamma that uh, V plus is a value of type P and it's going to be written like this with instead of the bar there will be a semicolon, no not semicolon, a, oh, how you call it, a semicolon. Yes. And this has a name in the literature, it's called the stoop. Um, it's a special place, just as, as like a stoop is a special place in, in a church. It's a special place in, in a proof where, where, where you should behave in a certain way. 
And uh, uh, so that's a new judgment. And then uh, the old judgment ex still exists, a positive term. And the old judgment still exists, a negative term. Yeah, OK, I'll try. So I hope that this is large enough. because I'm going to overwrite it. So I'm going to modify uh, the proof system accordingly. The formulas are the same, but now I will use another abbreviation. So remember that I use the abbreviation that V is either a V plus or a T minus. So accordingly, I will use uh, this judgment, V double bar gamma. It's just, well, it's just for the sake of a few minutes. This funny judgment will disappear when I go to indirect style. This stands for two things. If V is a V plus, then it stands for V plus gamma with the semicolon in the scoop. Or if it is a T minus, it stands just for T minus is a term, a negative term. So it's just to put two, these two cases together. So now the rules look as follows. In order to form the tensor, I need actually to have a V1 and a V2, not an arbitrary T1 and a T2. And this V1 must be typed according to uh, the discipline. Okay. And here, this goes, this is in the soup. Uh, there is no change here, no change here. Here the same thing. This should be a V1, and this should be in the scoop. Um, and there's one rule missing, which tells me that any value is a term. So there's one additional rule, which I'm going to put here that if uh, I have that V is of type P gamma, then I also, the also have that V of type P is a term of type gamma. So it's similar in spirit to the uh, rule that we have seen in, the in linear logic. We forget the information that we are in, in the scoop som somehow. We forget something. Okay. So now, this is so far for reducing the space of proofs. Now I will reduce uh, the, I also will reduce the operation of semantics. So for the operation of semantics, yeah, probably I'll need to use uh, uh, the beginning of uh, to, uh, tomorrow morning to, to finish the, the program today. But I prefer to go more slowly because yesterday I was told to go too fast. So anyway. Um, yeah, so... <coughs> the first rule is the most important. It's new, because this category did not exist, V+. plus. The second rule is as before. Um, is it sensible to write?
And I'm stopping here because I would like you to notice that with this system, I'm not going to have any critical pair anymore. Because you remember, what one of the critical pairs of that we have analyzed for linear logic was this one. Okay, and this critical pair is extremely dangerous when uh, x does not occur in C and y, uh, C1, C2, and uh, y plus does not occur in C2, because that's then the weakening, weakening pair which I already warned you against. So this pair is extremely dangerous, but it's not there anymore because I'm not allowed to reduce this one when it is this term, which is precisely a non-value. It's a T plus, which is not a V plus. So because I have this special regime that says that positive variables can only be substituted with values while negative variables can be substituted by any negative terms, I'm getting out of the non-conference problem. I'm setting some uh, discipline on the way that cuts should be transported uh, during the proofs and I'm forbidding some of the reductions. Good. And then the rest is as before. So that's, that was the key. The other rules are as before, just, just uh, respecting uh, the uh, call by value regime for x plus and call by name regime for x minus. So now for, uh, for a pair, I know that it's v1, v2. Um, yes. mu x1, x2, c reduces to c where uh, v1 replaces x1 and v2 replaces x2. And here, this is really one of these two cases because a v is either v plus, in case it will be v1 plus replaces x1 plus, or it is a T minus, in this which case it will be a T minus which replaces an X minus. So it's one of these two cases. And similarly for in left of V1, I don't repeat everything we have seen this already. Okay. So that's the operational semantics. And we don't need anything else. So we are here. We've got a working system for classical logic that only manipulates focused proofs and that uh, computes with them. And we will show tomorrow that cut can be eliminated so that we really have a strongly normalizing system. And it is confluent by construction because there is not a single critical pair in this system. Okay, so what is new in this work? Well, it's, it's a work that is going on since uh, two or three years. It's what is new is the syntax. The underlying uh, logic is essentially the one of uh, Girard, which is called LC. So the effort, the main effort that I'm describing and, and emphasizing, he emphasizing here is, is, is a syntactic um, decoration and uh, understanding of this work. Okay, so let me move. I think I still have about 10 minutes, even a bit more because I was eaten five minutes by the vote. But I, I would like also to leave some space for questions. I think I want to go as far as here, for sure, and to give just a pre-announcement of uh, the encoding of CBN and CBV. And we will do the last three points uh, with, uh, uh, as, as a first half of the next lecture. Okay, so what I want to do is uh, to 
make a further little change, which I can explain here. Uh, I want to avoid this funny thing here, and actually to have this, which sounds a little bit more easy to grasp. A pair of values is a value of type tensor is a pair of values. And I want to have this as well. So I want to forget about this. I want to do this sim in, in a simpler way. But then, then actually this will be a P1 because the value is always of positive type. This will be a P2. This will be a P1 tensor P2. This will be a P1. This will be a P1 tensor P2 uh, uh, plus P2. So that means that actually my syntax of formulas is going to be also seemingly more restricted. And similarly here, these, going, these are going to be negatives. These are going to be negatives. So in other words, I want to move from a world where I can tell the sign of a formula just by its head connective. I want to move from this to a world where the connective itself has a polarity. I want to say that the tensor is a connective that takes two positives and gives me a positive. This is, from the semantic point of view, it seems to be more reasonable. But on the, at the same time, I would be very happy to be still able to account for a thing like this. I still want to maintain the possibility to do the tensor of a negative and a positive. But I want to do this with explicit signs. So actually, in order to account for this, I will not do this. I will write explicitly down n tensor p. So I will introduce two modalities, not to be confused with the modalities of linear logic, because they don't play the same role, which are downshift and upshift. And I need to give you now the rules for the two, these two connectives. You may be surprised to see that uh, uh, a negative assumption is named by positive variables, but, but think of the axiom. The axiom tells me that from the, it's, it's written here. So I have, for example, that x of type x plus is of type p under the assumption that x plus is of type p bar. That's the reason why x plus in a context, it has a negative type in order to make x plus as a term to make it a positive term. Okay, so I think I'm ready to... Now I have uh, almost... I think everything is okay. Yes. So I need now to give the rules for this. But in order to give the rules for this, the best is to see what happens. So we could do it here. What happens in a focus proof? So suppose that I have to decompose n tensor p, gamma, delta. And I'm in the soup. So that means I'm really working on this positive formula. And
what I would write in terms of push search would be something like that. Because P is positive, I maintain the focalization constraint in the further uh, proof attempt. But here, because N is negative, I'm freed from uh, the constraint. But it's with this decomposition, it is more sensible to do an intermediate step, which is to write this down N here. And then to say that I'm arriving to this formula, which is still in the stoop. And then, because this is going to be the rule for the down connective, then I have this. So that's the rule. So I'm going to plug it in here. So if I have uh, I'm, I'm, I'll write the term after. Maybe to um, so if T minus is a term of type N, then T minus down is of type down N gamma. And that means in the syntax, I'm going to add one case uh, to the V plus. Okay, I'll, I'll do it just right after. And uh, the other rule for introducing the up one is going to be if C is of type X minus dot P gamma, then mu X minus dot C So you see again the same choices in the syntax. This is positive, irreversible, hence I use a constructor. This is negative, hence I use a binding construct. And then in the operational semantics, I have one rule which is again in the same kind of scheme that we have seen for general connectives except that my very first attempt of general connective is not powerful enough to, to take account of such a connective that changes the sign of, uh, of uh, the formula, but uh, the more advanced notion of general connective will do. So we have that T minus down mu x minus down dot C reduces to C where T minus replaces X minus. Again, it's a pattern matching construct and I destroy the uh, this downshift decoration in the process of applying the rule. Okay, so once this is done, I now I have a system, so now it's complete here, which we call system in indirect time. And uh, one of the reasons for calling it like this is that you will see that <coughs> encoding the system in indirect style into intuitionistic logic is going just to be a kind of jeu d'écriture in French, so that means just to play with the uh, words but essentially to do some kind of textual transformation. Okay, so uh, what I want to do is to just add these two cases, uh, and this one here, and what I just want to do now is to give you a short preview of call by name and call by value implication. So if I want to explain A implies B to my logic students who are not especially 
uh, trained in type theory or constructivism or whatever, I will tell them that this is not A or B. Okay? And the question is, um, I can do this in a positive way and I can do this in a negative way. So if I do this, so this R is going to be a power. Okay? So I will try to write P bar par Q. And I will try to write M bar par N. But this, in, in my indirect style, I cannot do this. I must be more explicit. Because par is a negative connective, so it cannot accept m bar, which is a positive formula. So this would be like this. So this is the official definition of CBN implication in system S. And for the implication, for the call by value implication, uh, I'm allowed to use p bar, which is negative. But I'm not allowed to use Q, so I should make it, uh, sorry, something is, no, that's correct. No. Okay, so is it correct? This is negative. This is incorrect. I turn Q, which is positive, into negative with the upper arrow. That's this is correct. So you see that I use two different encodings for two different notions of implication. And what we'll do, what, what we shall do tomorrow is we wish, we will, uh, I will exhibit you terms for the lambda abstraction for the application that are actually uh, macros corresponding to this complex uh, decomposition of the implication. Okay, so I'm stopping here. Questions? Yeah. Is there a question for shift if you try to think of a tank? Uh, uh, yes. So yes, there's definitely this idea that you that you consider uh, a, a term as a value. Okay. So it's precisely this guy, which was just a term. Now it has a value three and a half it has a value. There's definitely a kind of explanation. And there is also a connection between so these two these two connectives together form a kind of a joint at the syntactic level. But if we were doing the semantics of it, it would be really that one. That means together they form a monad. From a joint we get a monad. And this monad in the setting that I'm presenting here, it's just not an arbitrary monad, it's, it's a continuity monad. It's another way to say that this indirect style is leading me to, uh, to the usual kind of double negation translation. Okay? But I'm, I'm, I'm still not doing it completely explicitly, I'm, I'm doing it uh, without uh, the language of monad. So that's one thing. And the other interesting thing, is that if my language was not so expressive as it is here, if, for example, here it's very expressive in the well, it's expressive enough so that I have as many negative formulas as I have positive formulas. So that means my syntax is self dual But suppose that it were not self dual This is, for example, the case of uh, uh, old lady by push value, which does not have 
it has uh, different categories like this, and they are not dual to each other. Then, <coughs> at least at the sub end of this, you, you have information on this at the very end of the slide that I will send today, uh, later today. Get them if someone is on the website already. Oh, they are on the website, but maybe not the best link to them. Not the one, uh, because there is one from last year which is much less. Anyway, in the case of uh, Levy, called by push value, this monad is not constrained anymore to be the continuity monad. That's why he can account for many effects. Because that, this is a monad, not necessarily the uh, continuation monad. <coughs> So that's interesting to, to, to have different views of what the shift does according to which, in which logical system it's living. And he calls them in a different way. He calls them uh, or the two forms, the, 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 he has an adjunction in these two forms of U and L, but they are the same.